Eddie Art Carroll for your Buick dealers. I rode 4,779 winners in my day. One of the greatest was Citation, about the most exciting thing you could watch on four legs. This is a Buick Century Citation on four wheels, a great Buick at an unbeatable price, with white Landau roof, custom body paint, power steering, automatic transmission, and white walls. Just 4683. Take it from this old horse lover's mouth. If you price a Buick, you'll buy a Buick. Bankers Trust introduces the Miss a Month Loan. It's not easy to pay back a loan month after month, so Bankers Trust has a loan that lets you miss one monthly payment a year. I'll miss any month that includes April 15th. Just tell us which month you want when you apply, and don't pay us that month. July. June. July. June. We'll tear the month you want right out of your payment booklet. So long, January. Ah, oh, the joys of the Miss a Month Loan, now at Bankers Trust. Sweet and low in iced tea, the perfect diet drink. Sweet and low. The choice is Channel 5, Metro Media New York 5. Mary Hartman, tonight at 11. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? The tragedy on 28th Street with nine dead. Nixon talks about the dumping of Spiro Agnew. Money lives still on the line in Holland tonight. And for the gossips, Jackie's German Prince. I'm Bill Jorgensen. This is the 10 o'clock news. I would ask the uh, fire commissioner to uh, meet with the district attorney tomorrow, in light of all the facts, and we think that the district attorney should take a very intensive look at this to see what violations uh, uh, occurred uh, in connection with failure on a part of the owner to conform to the building code. That order from Mayor Beam after a fire burned through a seedy Manhattan bathhouse and overnight hotel this morning. Nine men were killed, two critically injured, and eight others hurt. The story now from Bob O'Brien. When firemen first arrived, shortly after 7 this morning, flames were roaring through the top two floors of the Everard Baths. The bathhouse, which catered almost exclusively to homosexual men, was crowded with as many as 100 overnight guests. There were 135 small cubicles on the top floors that served as guest rooms. Fire Commissioner John O'Hagan says residents of the bathhouse apparently tried to put out a mattress fire around 5 or 6 this morning without calling the fire department. O'Hagan says the mattress fire was not fully extinguished and reignited. Michael James, one of the guests at the bathhouse, says once the fire got going in earnest, it spread very quickly. I ran down one flight of stairs. I ran back up the flight of stairs and couldn't get into, in through the maze of hallways to get back to my room. Did you the hear people floor, yelling to get up? Everybody was yelling that, you know, this way down, this way down, because everyone was trying to make it to the fire escapes. Was it full of smoke? completely and there was no electricity so everyone was disoriented no matter where you were it was just pitch black and, and the smoke was just cutting into your, your lungs and your eyes and your nose and everything it was just horrible it took 200 firefighters more than an hour to bring the fire under control so that a search of the building could begin the bodies of six men were found this morning several others died later at Bellevue Hospital but the roof collapsed on the main housing area, and a thorough search of those 135 cubicles cannot begin until a crane is brought in to remove overhanging and dangerous debris. Several people had been injured in 1972 when a two-alarm fire gutted the top floor of the bathhouse. Last August, the fire department ordered the owner of the baths, Irving Fine, to install an automatic sprinkler system. Fine had until this July to comply with the order. A sprinkler system had been installed, but was not operational when the fire started this morning. Fire Commissioner O'Hagan says if the system had been working, it's likely no lives would have been lost. The owner had also been ordered to install a sprinkler system back in 1964. He appealed the order. The building was re-inspected by a deputy fire chief who said the sprinklers were a must. The owner appealed a second time in 1965. That time he succeeded in having the order reversed. A senior officer from the Division of Fire Prevention was uh, dispatched to review it. Uh, in his opinion, uh, he said that the order could be rescinded if the building owner met certain conditions that he uh, laid down. What were the conditions he set for this 
place? Well, he, he uh, set conditions such as uh, enclosing uh, stairs with fireproof doors, uh, reducing fire loading in the cellar, uh, closing a hole in the floor between the uh, second and third floor. Uh, in his opinion, he seemed to think that that was uh, adequate to allow uh, the rescinding of the order. From the period of approximately, uh, I would say, 64 on, uh, we have had our uh, capacity for making inspections reduced by restric restrictions in the firefighters' contract, by an increase in workload in the department, and a reduction in manpower. So whereas we used to inspect these buildings once a year, now we're lucky to get around to them three or four, uh, once every three or four years. That partially explains why the order wasn't reinstituted from 65 up until uh, 76. Commissioner O'Hagan says it may be several days before the final death toll is known. Men who stayed at the bathhouse traditionally left their wallets and valuables in safe deposit boxes at the main desk. Firemen opened all those boxes this morning and found unclaimed valuables belonging to 23 people. Only one of those boxes has been matched up with a person known to be dead or injured. So, as of now, as many as 22 persons may still be missing. This is Bob O'Brien. Also tonight, Richard Nixon covers the Agnew scandal while his former aide, John Ehrlichman, gives up on his appealing his prison term as the 10 o'clock news continues. This is Gay Pressman with a story about the man who's supposed to guard against corruption in the sanitation department. He's accused of corrupt acts himself. This is Marvin Scott in a posh east side townhouse where sex was for sale 24 hours a day. That is, until today. This is Bill Mazur. Who would tie up traffic on 6th Avenue like this? The greatest, Muhammad Ali. You think it's all sweetness and light inside City Hall? They're feuding and fussing like the Hatfields and the McCoys. This is Steve Bauman on Governor's Island, where for the first time in history, women in the Coast Guard will be going out to sea. This is Stuart Klein with a review of the new science fiction movie, Star Wars. When the Airline Passengers Association surveyed frequent flyers and asked them to pick their number one choice for domestic travel, the winner was American Airlines. But maybe we were just lucky. More recently, the Opinion Research Corporation asked virtually the same question. And this time, the winner is American Airlines. Chosen number one twice in a row. That's not being lucky. That's being best. Let's see what's happening in the star this week. By now, is there anything we don't know about Charlie's Angels? You bet. This week's star analyzes each angel's sex appeal and shows you how to develop your own. Next, you'll get Weight Watchers' 12 new super slimming sumptuous summer drinks, plus tips on picnics, making summer safer, jogging in a jiffy, and the latest on everybody you've been hearing about, talking about, wondering about. Make shopping complete with a star. It's bigger than life and more fun than people. Mitchell, Haldeman, and Ehrlichman, all former Nixon administration top brass and all convicted for the crimes of obstructing justice, conspiracy, and lying under oath. They were sentenced to 30 months to eight years in prison. Ehrlichman has already begun serving his time at an Arizona prison camp while he appealed his case. Of course, that appeal was turned down by the United States Supreme Court early this week, and now Ehrlichman says he is giving up. He won't try for another hearing. Mitchell and Haldeman, who have still not served as much as a day in jail, say they will try another appeal. Their lawyers have asked for a postponement of the date when Judge John Sirica will order the men to surrender and start serving their time. Richard Nixon says that since he resigned, his life has been without purpose and he has nothing to live for. The former president expressed his sorrow on another interview with David Frost here on Channel 5 tonight just a few moments ago. And after four years, it's all over next month for the Watergate Special Prosecution Force. Its job is done, it says, and the tidbits left can be handled by the Justice Department. The last major case was the Supreme Court's refusal to hear the appeals of Haldeman, Mitchell, and Ehrlichman. There had been suggestions to make the office permanent, just in case of another incredible scandal. But instead, Congress is considering legislation calling for a court-appointed temporary special prosecutor, if that should ever be necessary. Governor Byrne tries to muscle the Port Authority, and we'll get to that story next. Morning, Tom. Morning. Pounding that pavement yesterday sure got me, George. This nagging backache ruined my sleep. Here, start taking these this morning. Dome's pills? They sure helped me. 
When nagging backache due to overexertion or everyday stress and strain comes on, Doan's pain relieving action often brings temporary relief and lets you get a good night's sleep. How's the back, Tom? Good. Oh, great. I'm Try right Doan's pills for relief of nagging backache. Now you don't need messy charcoal to get that great charcoal taste. You don't need dangerous starting fluid. You don't need to light match after match. Now there's the electric charbecue. It comes with permanent briquettes. Plug it in anywhere and you'll get that great charcoal taste. The portable electric charbecue. It makes old fashioned barbecuing really old fashioned. The Contempra electric charbecue on sale at all leading department stores. The powerful Port Authority decided to stonewall against the commuter's screams and raise bridge and tunnel tolls drastically and to use the additional millions of dollars to bankroll other projects like improved railroad service, which is a money loser. Well, New Jersey's Governor Byrne originally backed the toll increase, but now he's trying to force the Port Authority into a rollback by vetoing the minutes of the Port Authority meeting. Byrne, in effect, hogties the agency's power to carry on its routine business, like paying bills, buying fuel, and contracting for endless maintenance work. Byrne still wants the rail service improved, but since the courts have said the use of the money on losing mass transit projects is forbidden by a contract with the bondholders, now he wants to cut the tolls. He asked the Supreme Court to reconsider its ruling on mass transit, but he did not veto the Port Authority's decision to appeal that court order. When a politician who is in office runs for re-election, he can't possibly devote full time to his job and the people he serves. That's true of any politician. And right now, New York City might be losing even more attention than we deserve from City Hall because of internal squabbling. Anthony Preisendorf has the story. It looks as though City Hall abhors a lame duck almost as much as nature abhors a vacuum. It all has to do with Mayor Bean, who wants to stay here, and his deputy, John Zaccotti, who wants to leave. Apparently, the Beam team can't wait until Zaccotti cleans out his office in the west wing of City Hall. In fact, one mayoral aide has even begun to check off Zuccotti's remaining days on a wall calendar. Zuccotti's people, on the other hand, feel they're being passed over, not being given enough to do. The Beam team, in turn, regards Zuccotti as a lame duck and tries not to include him or his staff in many high-level campaign strategy sessions. Also, the mayor's people have openly suspected Zuccotti's aides of leaking stories to the New York Times, a suspicion that has fueled public shouting matches in the hallways and offices of City Hall this past week or so. The mayor's office, when it's not planning campaign strategy, is now trying to plug those press leaks. But none of this is making life or work any easier for any of the participants. As one loyal beam aide was quoted as saying, the situation is entirely out of control. When I asked Zuccotti to comment on all this feuding and fussing, he snapped, it's ridiculous. But he said he was busy, much too busy, to be interviewed. But if you look at his schedule, it's only about half as crowded as it used to be, because they're not giving him as much to do. Politics can be a very rough business, especially when you're on the downside. This is Anthony Preisendorf. And to flap over missing garbage bags, the possibility of corruption among sanitation department officials, and the arrest of the man who's supposed to fight corruption. It's all tied together. And Gabe Pressman unravels the whole story for us. The sanitation pier at 59th Street and the Hudson River is the focus of the investigation. And Investigation Commissioner Nicholas Capetta today announced the arrest of the Sanitation Department's Inspector General, 51-year-old Walter Backman. The charges? Obstructing an official inquiry, lying under oath, destroying official records. It all involves 40,000 plastic trash bags stored at this pier. The bags disappeared last February. Backman pleaded not guilty at his arraignment today. He was suspended by Sanitation Commissioner Vaccarello from his jobs as both Inspector General and Commander of Sanitation Police. Scapetta detailed the accusations against Backman. His charge that he uh, destroyed an investigative report and subsequently arranged for a false burglary to be staged at a Department of Sanitation warehouse in order to attempt to cover an inventory loss and an attempt to destroy physical evidence, inventory records that were in that warehouse. What was the motivation, Commissioner, for this alleged cover-up? Well, without uh, speculating on the evidence, uh, let me say that the original investigative report that, uh, was, uh, that we charge was destroyed by the defendant uh, contained the names of some high-ranking uh, officials of the Department of Sanitation.
Later, an unusual incident. We saw a man at the window of the warehouse upstairs on Pier 99. He withdrew and he saw the camera. The sanitation commissioner's office had given us permission to film in the warehouse, but the man or men inside refused to lift the door. Pretty heavy security. The doorbell had a siren sound. What the men at the warehouse had to hide today, if anything, was uncertain, but they wouldn't let us in, even though the commissioner's office had given us permission to go there. One thing is certain. Backman was the watchdog over corruption in the sanitation department. And if he's convicted of these charges, the lesson will be that in government and politics, every watchdog needs another watchdog. This is Gabe Pressman. Channel 5 News has been airing the views of candidates who are seeking the presidency of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association. The ballots are out, and the count to determine the winner will be taken on June 10th. So far, we have heard from Ken McFeely, Sam D'Amelia, Frank Hughes, and Stanley Bleacher. Tonight, Phil Caruso tells why he thinks he's the best man for the job. I have devoted 10 of my 18 years in the police service toward the PBA. I am very deeply involved in PBA affairs. I believe that I have the leadership qualities that can get this organization moving again along constructive lines. I am not a self-anointed candidate, however. I was nominated by a group of people who, in their own right, can lead this organization. I think that's a unique position that I hold. Uh, the PBA over the last three years has been slightly chaotic. And I believe that with 160 delegates now supporting myself and the RMP team, I can provide the unity and the leadership and direction by bringing in new people, new ideas to get this organization rolling back along constructive lines so that we can achieve those goals that all police officers are seeking. An ad in Screw Magazine challenged men to make their fantasies a reality. Telephone number was listed, this call for an appointment. Well, that invitation aroused the curiosity of police. Marvin Scott says they went to an east side building. East 61st Street is one of Manhattan's more elegant streets, lined with trees and rich townhouses. From the outside, you'd have no idea what was going on inside this townhouse off 3rd Avenue. Police say it was a sex for sale parlor that operated 24 hours a day. The calling cards identify the establishment by the innocuous name, East Side Dismantling. What was dismantled, say the authorities, were all sexual inhibitions. A battery of telephones in the kitchen handled hundreds of calls from people responding to the newspaper ad. Six well-appointed bedrooms accommodated the customers who would pay a minimum of $60 an hour for various sexual services, including a luxurious bubble bath. The special room of the house is on the third floor. Police call it the chain or torture room, a room filled with equipment used for sadomasochistic activities, chains, manacles, leg irons, and a wide assortment of whips and other paraphernalia. Uh, this is sort of a... Uh a room for bondage type of situations where uh, a fellow would come along and he'd want to be uh, sort of tied up and uh, the girl perform various acts on him. Some people want to be tied up here and uh, the girl would take uh, something like this, a cat of nine tails, and sort of beat them on the back or whatever they wished uh, performed on them. When police raided the establishment shortly after noon, they found a customer in this room. Sergeant, do you believe that this operation was financed by organized crime? Yes, I believe it was. Due to the plushness of the operation, the size, they had a day and night shift working here, apparently. It takes a lot of money to set up an operation like this. The public morals cops arrested a total of six people, five women and a man who worked the day shift. The customer was released in his own recognizance. The charges against those arrested? Promoting prostitution, prostitution, and possession of a deadly weapon. Police said they recovered a fully loaded 38 caliber revolver in the house. Today's raid will barely make a dent in the city's illicit sex business. Officers can see the futility of it all. Those arrested today, they say, probably will be slapped with nothing more than a fine, and it's more than likely they'll soon be back in the same business, yeah. although perhaps at a different address. This is Marvin Scott. School kids beg for their lives in a Holland nightmare that goes on and on. A story we'll get to in a moment after this commercial break. Dad, you always said you can't beat the system? Well, I did. The big one, Bell. By buying our business phones from Teltronics instead of renting from Bell, I beat their escalating equipment charges. 
saves us thousands. Teltronics is the area's largest private business phone company. They have round-the-clock service, and to get them in, all I did was call. You could say I used the system to beat the system. Eddie Art Carroll for your Buick dealers. I rode 4,779 winners in my day. One of the greatest was Citation, about the most exciting thing you could watch on four legs. This is a Buick Century Citation on four wheels, a great Buick at an unbeatable price, with white Landau roof, custom body paint, power steering, automatic transmission, and white walls, just 4683. Take it from this old horse lover's mouth. If you price the Buick, you'll buy a Buick. On the double! Even a tough American craves some continental romance. So I indulge in Van Heusen's new classic collection shirts. Spirit reminds me of my last mission, Paris. But the fit and quality, USA. Now to introduce these classic collection dress and sport shirts, you can save up to four dollars. Come save now at the ANS nearest you. For a quarter continents, Kendall Motor Oil. Almost nothing's like it used to be. There's no more easy way. And there's a whole lot of saving you've had to do to get the car you're driving today. Isn't it great to know, isn't it fine? The Kindle oil gives you peace of mind. And doesn't it make a whole lot of sense to drive your car with Kindle Confidence? Or a quart of confidence, Kindle Motor Oil. The people of the Netherlands turned out at the polls today for their national elections, but fear rather than politics is really the number one issue there right now. About 166 hostages are still being held by Moluccan terrorists aboard a train and inside a schoolhouse. Today, three men either jumped or were shoved off of that train. They were all hauled back aboard, the train apparently unhurt. And there was another horrifying ordeal at the schoolhouse. Some of the youngsters, prodded by the gunmen, went to the windows and chanted, We want to live. The government says it won't negotiate with the Moluccans until those children are released. The terrorists want some of their friends freed from Dutch jails and a jumbo jet to let them all make a getaway. The deadline was 8 o'clock this morning, but the hour passed and nobody was killed. Not long after the government lifted the ban on travel to Cuba, the Florida office of Mackey Airlines said it would resume flights to Havana. Well, shortly after noon today, a bomb blew out a brick wall in the windows of a Mackey office in Fort Lauderdale. No one was hurt. About an hour later, a man with a Latin accent telephoned UPI, said the bomb was placed by an anti-Castro group because the rights of Cubans are being violated. Mackey immediately announced it is dropping plans for those Havana flights. If Cuba really wants to improve its relations with the United States, it had better think twice about sending any more of its military technicians to help the leftist government of Ethiopia fight civil war in Somalia. Our State Department says that 50 Cubans are already there, and there are rumors that 500 more be on, may be on their way within the next couple of weeks. Our government regards this as a very serious development. It says all Cuban activity in Africa will be watched very closely because any further involvement can hurt chances for better understandings with the Castro government in Havana. U.N. Ambassador Andrew Young is on his way home after a 16-day African trip, which often gained him national headlines. During a stopover in London, Young told reporters that he thought he had at least persuaded leaders of black independent movements in Southern Africa that armed struggle is not the only road to freedom. A few days ago, President Carter fired Major General John Singlaub as our Chief of Staff in Korea, and today, Defense Secretary Harold Brown said the President, as Commander-in-Chief, really had no alternative. Singlaub said that Korea would be overrun by the communists if our forces leave. Brown claims the general knew that we were withdrawing the troops at the time he made that comment, and he had no business criticizing the president's policy. Singlob testified at a command performance before a Congressional Armed Forces subcommittee today, and Marion Brewer was there. Major General John Singlob says he expects to end up as the football in the skirmish over the future of U.S. troops in Korea. The two-star general answered more than half a dozen hours of questions from the subcommittee, which split between conservatives and liberals rather than along traditional party lines. So we've learned nothing new as a committee from the general's testimony. We could have learned this from the CIA or the DIA. 
to have the general here is, a, in my mind, a way to embarrass the president on the decision-making process. And it's a shame that uh, General Singlog has to be that instrument. And I think it's most unfortunate that uh, he's not going to be in Korea. I can't think of a better officer to represent our interests in Korea and to rep represent our interests across the table at Han Mun Jam than General Singlog. I think it's unfortunate that he's not going back. Stratton, who chairs the Armed Services Investigation Subcommittee, says this hearing is the first in a series which will look into U.S. defense commitments worldwide. However, others on the subcommittee characterize the session as a frontal assault on President Carter's proposed Korean troop withdrawal, an assault which could make the president's policy difficult to enforce. From Washington, Marion Brewer reporting. And after all the testimony today, newsmen were waiting for the general. Well, I'd just like to uh, perhaps summarize what uh, I said in my uh, opening statement this morning. And that uh, basically is that I have every intention to carry out uh, any of the lawful decisions and orders issued by my superiors. And it was not my intent in this uh, incident to circumvent or short circuit the chain of command or to uh, try to influence the foreign policy decisions of the president. But you do disagree with the Korean pullout, right? Yes, I do disagree with the Korean pullout. I've said that several times in the open hearing today. And right now I am anxious to go find out what my new assignment orders are, and I intend to go and execute uh, whatever mission the Army has for me at this time. Because of all this fuss, our government has assured Korea today that the withdrawal of our 33,000 troops from there...